This is On The Wire, Racing TV's podcast for the best racing previews in association with Bar One Racing. Hello and welcome. And on this week's show, we have Aidan O'Brien and Colin Keane talking ahead of Longines Irish Champions Weekend. Uh, we've got a weekend to savour coming up next weekend. The return of decent crowds as well in Ireland. And we have Fran Berry and John McDonnell as ever to go through the cards on Saturday. No racing on Sunday in Ireland this week. Uh, we've lots to get through. How are you getting on, gentlemen? Starting with you, Fran. Could be better, Johnny. Yeah, it's uh, all roads lead now to Leopardstown and Decorah next weekend. And uh, great news, obviously, about at least there's what 4,000 there and a couple of thousand at La Stole. We're, we're inch, inching back to normality, I suppose. And, uh, you know, great weekends racing in store, a little bit more mundane this weekend, but uh, the weather's holding up and, uh, yeah, all good. What have you been up to this week? I was in Clamel last night, actually. Uh, it was actually. Um, Good, good old atmosphere down there last night. Uh, you know, good, nice evening down there, and uh, you know, some good results. Uh, Takarengo winning the Tipperary Cup, uh, a race with a great history. Um, I remember leading up to winner of it for dad with Shankrack back in 1993, and he went on to win the GPT afterwards. So that's that's a, a fond race for me. I don't think I ever won it as a jockey. I probably got beaten on numerous occasions, but uh, a very good finish to yesterday. And a track that's close to your heart, Johnny Mack of uh, Bar One Racing. Yeah, I'm from Clonmel, Horstown Park. First track, I suppose, that I was introduced to horse racing, brought out there um, when I was a kid. But I, funny enough, I was in Dundalk yesterday, Johnny. And Johnny Fien had a, a wealth had a newcomer. I actually sent Fran a message yesterday morning. There was a lot of money for that Johnny Fien newcomer yesterday, um, Anatoly. It had won two barrier trials at Dundalk and uh, he got the, the job done. Maybe not as easy as you'd have expected. What do you think of it, Fran? Thought he'd done well. He was keen, uh, very keen early on. And then he dropped a bit and he travelled well into the race. And uh, the venture runner up had a run and had the momentum up to go and beat him. And he found he found plenty for pressure. Uh, maybe that national stakes entry is a bit ambitious, but he get well sold on the back of that, I would imagine. He was um trialed there one, two trials. So he's been well prepped and uh, John Fien is a very shrewd operator, and I expect he was after yesterday. I I thought what um what was interesting. Obviously, Eddie Lynham had a good day as well. Um, did you hear his interview, lads, where he spoke about John Riggins, who's entered in um, the Bow Lad effectively uh, Champions Weekend, and this horse has been dropped four pounds since he since he won his maiden, which was his first start for Eddie Lynham, when he beat a stable mate who you subsequently napped Fran and won well. Um, I think he's going to get in uh, to the bowl, lad. He's step up six furlongs. I don't think it'll be a problem. He's going to get in. I, I think this horse could be so well handicapped because um, it was his first start for Eddie Lynham. And when he ran um, at the Cora first time for Eddie Lynham, he met so much trouble, yet he, he produced this turn of foot that was quite stark. And I think he's going to be running off maybe 84, 86 in the bowl, lad. And I don't know, Fran, I'd be all over him. Lack of experience would be a biggest uh, worry from taking mm. on a, a battle hardened campaigners. Yeah, I can see the opposite. Johnny, I think. Uh, that made him strong and uh, good good purchase by connections and uh, an interesting horse. And uh, nice to see Eddie Lyon back with a bit of a run. Yeah, it's always good when he's around the winners and close, get good, good value of him. And, uh, and uh, he's just been lacking the quality in recent years for whatever reason. It just goes through phases, I suppose. And, uh, you know, he's Dundalk has been good in show on the road, but uh, the likes of that horse could step up there for him again. And how are the shops, Johnny Mac? Um, I suppose as France is raising back to normality, um, how have the shops mm -hmm. been for bar one? And is is that semblance of normality coming back in terms of people putting on bets over the counter? Steadily, Johnny. Some shops are stronger than others. Betting shops in general tend to go hand in hand with uh, with pubs. So mm. um, with the pubs beginning to reopen and once people start to make their way back to them you'd imagine the shop trade will pick up some shops are doing a lot better than others so and i think that's the general consensus across the estate with all companies yeah interesting times ahead and interesting times ahead uh, for colin Keane. um so basically this week there were a couple of zoom calls where colin Keane and aiden o'brien were sort of wheeled in front of the press but on zoom and uh, they spoke about champions weekend but when i spoke to colin it was more so about um i suppose jur lines allowing them to have rides for the likes of derma weld and here's what he had to say colin i'm just looking at your your strike rate for jur lines um no jur line strike rate always amazes me how good it is but you've one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen 
14 trainers this season that you've ridden for maybe sporadically that you've even an even better strike rate for. Um, how kind of important has it been for you that he's allowed you to, you know, spread your wings, particularly with Dermot Weld? Because you've had 128 rides for Dermot Weld. Um, and I'm just looking at, you know, the he, he obviously allowed you to kind of, you know, even ride for what is effectively a rival trainer in some respects. Yeah, well, I suppose, well, Mr. Well kind of approached him first before he approached me. Yeah. And then JR said it to me. So it was kind of between them that came up with the idea, to be honest. Uh, and he'll, uh, well, his motto is kind of, he'll always, he'll always let me off to ride a winner if he doesn't think his horse can win, basically, is what he always tells me. Uh, he, w- he would never try and get in your way or make you ride if just for the sake of riding it. That's exceptionally fair. Oh, very fair, very fair. Not many trainers would would be like that. So no, I, as I say, I, I'm very fortunate to be in the position we're in. And do you find, because I'm sure your mates with, we'll say, the likes of Oshin and the lads that ride for Dermot Well, Chris Hayes and all that, going back like that, you're, you're friendly with these lads. Is do, do you still get on with lads that kind of ride winners for him as well, if that makes sense? Oh, I do, yeah. Um, like my 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 main boss obviously is is Jer, uh, and. Just this year, obviously, the way the connection has come with Mr. Well, like, but we're just grateful to be getting the, the extra rides outside of chairs, to be honest. And um, in terms of his strike rate, I know you've spoken about him there, but like you, you say he thinks outside the box because there, there must be something to it. He doesn't overrun his horses like he's he, ha- he has maintained a very good strike rate, but like it's not as if he has the pedigrees that Bally Doyle have necessarily to work with either. So he's doing something right. Yeah, definitely. I think like he doesn't. I don't know. The right like he won't run them just for the sake of running them. Mm. If he doesn't think they're going to win or run respectable or be in the fight to make sure they get a run the next day, he he won't run them. Or if they're at a certain level or he not working to a certain level, uh, he he probably won't run them either. So as I say, he just he won't run horses just for the sake of it. In terms then of the, the young jockeys coming up, Dermot Well, I think, said maybe last year, this is the best generation of jockeys that he's seen in Ireland. Um, maybe that's because he started using you, actually. But um, what's, uh, what do you make of them? Like, there seem to be really, really talented young lads coming up and, and lassies as well. Yeah, a lot of good, uh, good apprentices in Ireland at the moment. Obviously, Dylan Brown McGonagall is flying the flag for the, I think, the apprentice title. I think he's a good bit in front. Uh, Sam Ewan, uh, Jerry's apprentice, is a very good rider as well. Two lads came from pony racing together. Um, Mikey Sheehy. And I'd say, you could, to be honest, you could be naming lads here all even if you wanted to keep going. There's a, there's a lot of good uh, apprentices and talent in the country at the moment. Could it come to you for advice, Colin, Colin, by the way, on that? Would anybody come to you and ask you for advice, any of them younger lads? Yeah, a lot of them would. A lot of them would come to any of the, the senior riders, to be fair. If say if they haven't rode a horse before and they've seen you ride it, they come and ask you your opinion about it or what to, what you thought about them, which I think is good. Uh, and if especially if they've done something wrong and you tell them uh, when you hit, see them listening to you and trying not to do it again, that's that's even better. Sorry, Johnny. Not at all, you know. And um, then in terms of like sort of girls getting into the the flat jockey game, like Rachel Brackmer has obviously done an amazing job national hunt. But um, is it something you see more down the line? Maybe like Siobhan Rutledge is a good example. She's flying it that um, maybe with weights and all that, that more girls can aspire to be, uh, I suppose, the new um, Holly Doyle or Josephine Gordon. I suppose it is possible. Yeah, obviously, as you say, Siobhan, uh, Nikita as well, this, as well. Uh, mm. there's a couple of female apprentices this year now and like that they're well able to ride and I suppose Rachel obviously is flying the flag for them she's a brilliant ambassador for the game so she is and racing is just so I don't know maybe something that's so special about it that the staff is almost like 50-50 in the gender balance yeah yeah exactly thanks Colin no bother Johnny how good is this lad Fran? he's just got something um a bit different, Johnny, doesn't he? You know, that's mm. that's I suppose the difference. He 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 make can make it happen. Um, 
I don't know how you quantify it or describe it, but it's interesting. Because I want to know yeah. from you as a jockey, like, because I, I can't either. I think he's, mm. he's, he's, you can see when he rides a horse from a bad draw, he gets to the front. When he, if he rides a horse in the front in running, his price uh, shortens dramatically. There's an awful lot of respect for him in terms of professional punters out there. And um, his pace judgment seems to be unbelievable. He's a lovely manner of cajoling a horse into a race without necessarily asking him for, for full effort. Um, but you're the jockey. Yeah. He's got um he's very good position wise, as you see, he's very good at getting out of the gates and into good positions, even from a wide draw. Uh, you know, he's been docked down to a T. Um, but he, he's he's got an unusual way of riding, he's got an individual style in a finish. He's almost got, you know, the Fallon had his Kieran Fallon had his individual style, Pat Edry, Mick, uh, Richard Hughes, they all have their own way of going. And Colin unusually tends to throw the reins at them, change his hands, and seems to get a good bit. Out and without having to resort to the whip, very good in a photo finish. He seems to get, be able to have a knack of getting their head down at the right time on the line. We see that day in, day out with him, and uh, I think that's one of his best assets on a horse in a race. But his biggest asset is mental, uh, mental agility, if you like, in that he's very level headed and um, he's obviously in a great comfort zone riding for Jar Lines. Who for, for Colin to go out every day riding for a trainer that's total belief in you, you can do no wrong. So it doesn't matter what you do. You're not second guessing yourself. You're riding, you're riding as you see fit and as you see at the time without being tied down to instructions. And that's a huge thing for a rider to, to go out there knowing that no matter what you do, your trainer's got your back and uh, it allows you to blossom. And he's duly blossomed over the last four or five years. And now the rest of the world it took a long time, actually. It was surprising yeah. in the, since COVID that all the big UK trainers have copped on to him, really. He wasn't getting them good UK runners runners when they came over to ride and up until COVID. And as a layer, Johnny Mac, like when he rides for Jar Lines, the strike rate Jar Lines has, and I spoke about it there, that, you know, he doesn't really run them for um, the sake of it. He's roughly one in four of his horses win, which is a hell of a strike rate in this country. He doesn't have access to the, you know, the stallions would say that Aiden has or whatever, primarily Galileo. Um, and they're, they're, when they're backed, they essentially either they run well or they just win. Yeah, um, when you look at those maidens in the chorus, say you might have an Aiden O'Brien hot pot, but you see a Jarlines newcomer in there maybe, and you always know you have a chance with a, a Jarlines newcomer. And he's got good, he's got good um, clients. There. The likes of Sean Jones up in Carried Macross is there a long time, but he's brought in David Spratt. He's obviously got the Jobman horses now as well. And he's definitely, I think Colin's growth has kind of coincided with Jar, hasn't it? Mm. Um, and yeah, they're turning into a formidable partnership. And just as well as that, Fran, like, I, I like the fact that it's very difficult for trainers in Ireland eh, when you're taking on the Colossus of, of Cool Moore, effectively. Yes, you can either kind of sit and feel sorry for yourself or do what your lines do, does and have fantastic facilities, have the horses very, very fit, have Colin Keane on your side, and then probably appreciate that Colin Keane is so good that we're actually going to let him ride for outside rides because it's better that we have him anyway. Oh, look, you, you got to let Colin Keane ride for whoever, whoever wants him. And uh, that stands to you because he can ride him all the time and he, he'll know the opposition when he is riding against him and riding for you. Um, oh, look, Jerry's thousand winners last week. A uh, huge mm. achievement. Uh, re reinvented the wheel, went from being a jumps jockey, jumps trainer to a flat trainer. And, uh, you know, he's he's an overnight success, 20, 20 year make. And like somebody said during the week and... Uh, I, I, I don't buy that though, Johnny. Um, you know, taking on a mighty Bally Doyle or Joseph Briner, it can be done in Ireland. Johnny Mort is doing it. William McCreary's done it from scratch. He's set up in a recession. Gordon Elliott came from zero. It's difficult, but it can be done. You know, it, it's not easy, but it, it can be done. I can't buy that. It, things are too hard. It's impossible. If you've got the will or the way, it can be done, you know. And uh, I think Jar Lines is the most recent longer term example of that but as I said Johnny Murta, William McCreary I can rattle off a few more that are really making inroads and um, Paddy Toomey's coming through and uh, you know you got uh, Gordon Elliott who started from zero and is back uh, in September as well. And France touched on a point there, which I spoke about with Aidan O'Brien, the passing of Galileo and how this might change the landscape in Irish racing and I, I did ask him as well about St. Mark's Basilica's potential as a stallion. I, I'm not sure he entirely answered the question, which I thought was interesting as well, but um, judge for yourself. Hi, Aidan, how are you? Johnny, good, thanks. How are you? Very well, thanks. Um, my, just a couple of questions, really, kind of more, yeah. more looking further down the line. Just 
How would you sum up, um, I suppose, the loss of Galileo for the stable going forward? I think everyone was kind of shocked when the news emerged. Um, but, you know, horses pass away and life goes on. But his legacy, so forth, and just, I guess, how it will affect things going forward. Yeah, no, sure. I think, the, the, uh, Johnny, it's, it's obviously a pity for everybody. But uh, I suppose, obviously, we, we had him for a long time and, and everyone was very aware of him for a long time. So I think... Uh, all his, his stock is obviously going to be more valuable going forward, uh, Phillies and Colts. Um, and like you said, like like obviously nothing is forever. Um, but I think his his uh, his genes and and his uh, his um, I suppose on the pedigree on thoroughbred breed for for like generations to come, it's it's going to be a, a, going to be a big effect, a big effect Galileo effect on pedigrees. So um. No, so listen, it was great to have him and uh, um, I think he's he's going to leave a mark that's probably like never has been left by any other stallion ever before. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the boss recognised him very early and uh, and used him very strongly in, on on uh, on all his mares for a long, long time. So, um, um, so listen, it was terrible and, and uh, pity, but like obviously... Like it, it's it happens and and that's the way. But it, it was great to have him for the length we've had him, really. Yeah, it's very interesting to say that because um, you're talking about the legacy and the genes. If you go back to Northern Dancer, but you've spoken so often about the toughness that he implanted in his stock, and um, I guess that's a massive boost to the breed as well as the ability that's there. Yeah, no, I suppose what was very unusual with him, Johnny, was not uh, is a trait that was in him in his stock mentally that wasn't really in any other stallion or, or uh, anything that we've ever had to do with the, the genuineness um, and the, I, I suppose the, the uh, ability to forgive a, a trainer no matter what um, um, every day a Galileo came out they came out with a clean slate, slate. They, they never thought about what happened the day before uh, or what was going to happen uh, the next day and they just kind of you just asked them what they wanted to do and, and told them what you wanted them to do and, and they did it like totally unconditionally which was very rare but it, it's a trait that it's inside in their mind that obviously you can't see it until you train them um but um it, i think it's it's going to be it's going to affect so many pedigrees going forward for like generations really that, that, that's amazing what you say and i guess that's kind of part of, partly why you love horses that you've probably never seen a stallion who was just there was so much consistency in terms of that effort from almost all sock yeah, that, that's right. And and obviously his stock that raced uh, that didn't show an awful uh, high level of ability, they seem to be putting it into their uh, offspring, uh, no matter what stallion they're by, which is, uh, which is very, very unusual. And th- finally, this is, this is probably a stupid question, but we'll say if St. Mark's Basilica is out of a Galileo bred mare, down the line, where might he fit in in terms of, I guess, the the, the next uh, step? Because he, obviously people are so excited about what he might do. Where, how can he kind of cross between Galileo bred mares and so forth, given his own pedigree? Yes, I suppose, uh, John, he's going to be like a, a obviously exceptional as well because he has all that genuineness from Galileo. It's, if you see him, he runs with his head out and down as well. And and obviously he's getting the speed from uh, Sayuni and Pivotal. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that's what is is very rare. Like, and he's he's uh, he goes along in a race. He he wastes no energy. Uh, he's just waiting on you to ask him, and uh, and then he has this explosive turn of foot when you do ask him, um, um, which makes him a very very rare horse. Um, and, and like very exciting. Obviously, it's it's a it's a I suppose it's it's a weapon that's it's it's um like seriously uh, hard to find. Uh, in, in any harsh really you're obviously excited by him and i guess it's just a long way away but point lonsdale as well as a potential stallion uh yeah he's he's very like obviously he's by australia and, and australia puts those genes into his into his stock as well and like galileo if you see point lonsdale he does the same thing he runs along there with his head out and down and and when you ask him to lengthen he, he his head just gets lower and he just gets his body just gets longer um, and uh, like obviously we like going to the line is he's at his lowest and longest throughout the whole race which is very very unusual as well and, and he's uh, he's full of those genes as well thanks very much for your time Ed pleasure Johnny what did you make of this Johnny Mac because um, 
the 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 St. Mark specific question, I think Aiden is very interesting when he does his interviews. He was in very relaxed form, whatever. Um said some fascinating stuff about Australia as a horse, about Point Longsdale and so on and so forth. Um the St. Mark's Basilic answer was quite interesting, I thought. Yeah, um, he's obviously a cult they hold in the, the highest regard. I think it was interesting to hear how he mentioned how he carries himself through a race. And uh, obviously, Johnny, he's their top dog this year. He's the horse they needed. And uh, they'll be hoping he can deliver on Champions Weekend. And Fran, what, what happens now when Galileo has his first or his last two-year-olds and so on and life begins without him? Um, are we going to see a different landscape in Ireland because he's not there? I think I think it's in, it's it's going to happen, and it's going to be a transition period for what two years, three years, four years until the next day. Uh, if it is say Mark's Basilica or um, what Bassett comes through uh, for Coolmore, and uh, at the moment, uh, you know, Frankel is dominant. I can see see the stars actually uh, coming good in the next couple of years. I reckon he's going to get a good view of the Galileo mares, given he, what is he half brother to him and. Uh, That'll be interesting. I can see him definitely stepping up a bit. And uh, you'd have to say Godolphin hold all the ace with the younger stallions at the minute, like with, with the with the Derby winner, um, the Irish Derby winner, Hurricane Lane, Adiar, mm. the likes of them horses being by Frankel. Uh, you know, it's going to be interesting times. But that's the great thing about this game. Nothing stays the same. It's always in motion. And, uh, you know, 20 years of Galileo, uh, maybe the last two years of Galileo hasn't been as good as you know, under radar, teams have not been as strong as what we've come to expect by him. But uh, St. Mark's Basilica is a big, big hope. And uh, he's got all the attributes. And I doubt we'll see him in training next year, given the passing of Galileo. It's, uh, just on that, so we're going to hear now from Aidan as well and Colin on um, their two kind of main hopes in the in the Irish Champions Stakes. But uh, betting first, Johnny Mack. Yeah, we're six to four St. Mark's Basilica, two to one Tarnawa. That's how it's shaping. Nine to two, the, the Bulger Code, Johnny. And it's much bigger prices the the others. I think it's like it's going to be the clash of the weekend. Yeah, with the with the week with the year we've had rather, uh, Poetic Flair winning um would be very very interesting with with Jim Bulger's comments about um alleged kind of drugs and racing and so forth. But um before we get to that, let's hear from the two lads. Yeah, she's, she's a lovely big lovely big chest on Philly. She's a good character about herself. She she'd eat you in the stable. Um, Dean rides her out and Davy. Looks after her as well. The two lads do a great job with her. Uh, she's she's pl- 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 good. She's a handful, I should say. As you seen the last day when the horse kicked the railing and she she jumped on top of on top of Davy going out and unseated me. But when she's going, she's very straightforward, uh, very uncomplicated, and just I think a very good filly. Yeah, I suppose I think it was is um was it the second or his uh, last piece of work one that piece of work um his, his shoe just it came off is is near four and uh it just caught his near hind joint uh when it was spinning um and just sliced the front of his joint and really what it is like is if you're um if you're down on all fours and you put your hands down as kind of as your joints just right across the front of your wrist you just slice that across and uh, obviously every time he bent is is uh his, his ankle it was opening um and uh, it was a clean cut um but obviously we weren't sure for a day or two um we got it straight away and cleaned it but obviously it got infected and we couldn't stop that from happening um and then um, and obviously after a, a day or so when we saw his his blood starting to rise like we didn't have any other choice um but put on but to put him on antibiotics and uh, obviously when that happened he couldn't run um so he, he missed all that time. Um, we got him back on as soon as we could and, and back into full work. And uh, I suppose uh, so far, everything uh, looks good. I have to admit, Fran, I'm a small bit disappointed in the champion stakes because I, I spoke uh, you know over the last couple of months about how Aiden had so many potential runners in the race. Sounds like now he's only going to have one. Um, he's taken on Tarnawa, who's a very good filly. Um, if not, I wouldn't argue that she's a superstar. Um, and it looks like it might be kind of uh, based on home runners. It does look that way, and uh, it's unfortunate, isn't it, that um, uh, Mishriff isn't coming. I thought... Um... Okay, reasonably quick turnaround from York, but a lot of her- horses have done that going to the Champion Stakes in the past. Mile and Quarter and Leopardstown, I think, would really play to his strengths. Shame not to see him there. Um, 
Poetic Flair stepping up to 10 furlongs if he does turn up be very interesting he'll have to relax he can be quite keen on occasions over a mile I think he will get the trip it's just he needs to relax early on he didn't relax in the French guineas and he didn't relax uh, all that well in Goodwood early on when it was soft ground that bogged him down uh, that's what he needs to do and he'll have to be ridden accordingly Ternar was the opposite she's dropping down in trip to me it's interesting that Dharma Well is really is taking her down to 10 furlongs because she's uh, excellent at a mile and a half. I think that's her best trip, but uh, maybe a mile and a quarter on Leopardstown, the outside track and uh, a positive ride will uh, see her to best effect. But it's it's all about St. Mark's Basilica for me. I think um, I think he's going to be very, very hard to beat in the day. His price uh, will reflect that, but um, for me, he's the one. I would uh, be interested though, Johnny, if we did have smaller... Uh, we're going to have a small amount of runners, but if um, Joseph O'Brien's uh, filly turned up uh, Thundering Knights as an outsider, I think she could outrun her odds, but there won't be any each way betting and say looking at the field at the minute. Yeah, what price is she, Johnny, Johnny Mac? Oh, she's around 16, Johnny, mm. at, at the moment. I mean, if you thought there was going to be a small field, there might be a bit of each way value to be picked up there now. But, but like St. Mark's Basilica's price, you're, you're effectively betting on his well-being because he is miles better than these, in my view, if he turns up surely. Then back him, Johnny. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know, Fran. I'm like, the fact that he's only running him in the race, is that not a sign of intent that the horse is grand? Well, he, he was even for the Eclipse, and he set, what is he, John, 6 to 4, 7 to 4 now? Um, 6 to 7 to 4, yeah. He'd give us twos, wouldn't you? <laughs> no. Seven, seven to four. If this if this horse rocks up for the champion stakes, how can he be anything like seven to four? He's, he, he'll be four to five in the day, I think, if yeah, he turns so, up. Yeah. He, so he's basically told us this week he's going to have run one runner in the race, likely. What are the prospects of Aidan O'Brien having no run in the race? I'd say almost zilch. So St. Mark's was still going to rock up. Um, now, I remember seeing the stars when he ran. There was a, He went way out in the betting because there was a bit of rain during the week and so forth. He was obviously backed off the boards that day. Um, am I missing something here, Fran? No, no, not at all. If he's declared Thursday, his price is going to tumble. And uh, we're getting out to the underwire viewers and listeners now that, uh, according to the trainer, the last we've heard and uh, seen pictures of St. Mark's that he is an intended runner and his only runner. So, look, if you want to roll the dice, I, I would roll the dice at them odds, yeah. So, effectively, Johnny Mac, open an account with Bar One Racing, have a bet on St. Mark's Basilica, go and collect Saturday week, enjoy your Saturday, and then have more bets, obviously, with, with, that, with that, that, two to, that two to one won't last for long either, lads. Yeah. <laughs> so, what am I missing here, Johnny Mac? I don't know, Johnny. It's there to be taken if you want it. It's a race, though, that's thrown up Great, great finishes, isn't it? It's becoming an iconic race, Johnny. Would you agree? I like ab- absolutely love this race. It's my, it's my favorite race, I think, in the entire racing calendar. Um, I was there. Unfortunately, I wasn't in racing into racing when Galileo ran against uh, Fantastic Light, but I was there for that amazing race that Falbrav ran in mm-hmm. when he was beaten by High Chaparral. Uh, do you remember that, Fran? Um, I don't think you'd arrived in the race, but the amount of Group Ones that they had, the field had between them that day, and it was a sense of, and you've spoken about this. Um, Daryl Holland came to Leopardstown and probably didn't understand how tricky the track can be. Yeah, uh, I actually done a piece with Mick Canan ahead of Champions Weekend and we had an interview with him obviously in racing TV last year speaking about that and uh, for the Friday Club uh, they weren't wearing masks back in 2012 or whatever but uh, 2002 whenever it was but Mick should have been wearing a mask because he was de- definitely robbing a champion stakes on that occasion so he was and uh, you know it was it was really interesting looking back on it uh, High Chaparral was the first of them Coolmore Derby horse to be kept in training as a four-year-old and he hadn't really blossomed as a four-year-old until then and uh, a month later Mick went out and dead heated in the Breeders' Cup with Johar and it was his last ride for Bally Doyle so in the year that he robbed an Irish champion stage he, he led heats in the breed hope probably one of the rides of all time he does that was his last ride for Valley Doyle, Valley Doyle. It? it was it was as official as official a uh, number one jockey he obviously rode from later on he won in Yates but just shows you how tough a game it is uh, to be at the top robbing champion stakes group ones nicking breeders cups on on a horse uh, that was all at sea around the track in the uh, in the breeders cup and uh, the next day you're out of the job one of the one of the great race of all time that dead heat with Johar, an unbelievable race. And I, I was just getting into racing at the time. And I remember watching with my dad, kind of with a bit of patriotism, that Ireland had a runner taking on the, the Americans. And um obviously that followed on from that champion stakes that was so epic. Um what what was your best ride in the race, Fran? You know what? I don't think I ever run, Johnny. Mm. So I didn't um uh, no, no uh, 
it's more concentrating on the mile and six handy and the seven hurling handicap. So it just goes day. to show, Johnny Mac, some people just don't appreciate greatness. No. Um Although Fran, you picked up plenty of uh, plenty of second strings for like the Bally Dial and classics, didn't you? Down the years, third oh, strings. De- yeah, de- definitely. And uh, just just the champion stakes beat unique. You only get usually get four or five, six runners, and uh, most uh, traders would have a paying rider or whatever to come for the race. Um, but uh, no, it's a fantastic race. But yeah, any of them weekends, say uh, you know, you're always hoping clashing with the same ledger in Doncaster, you might pick up a good ride, and uh, often did in the matron stakes and things like that. So it creates its own opportunities, and uh, you know, it's a shame here that there isn't more users in this race because I do think we need a uh, we need the likes of Sotsas coming last year. It was only mm. prep for him for the arc, but at least he came to Leopardstown and Gaia, of course, who got beaten. And that that was some race last year. When you look back, him and Magical in a race that he thought was going to get tactical and maybe a bit messy. It wasn't. It was just a proper horse race. And this is the beauty of On The Wire since we've become video format. We can just decide here and now that we're actually going to look back on last year's race. And here it is. Then comes Japan, Sotsas Armory, four lengths to Lear the Fury into the straight, two furlongs to go. And it's Gayath from Magical, and Japan's gone for the rail. Sotsas Armory stays on, racing towards the final furling and a half. Roll up, roll up, it's Magical on the near side, who's trying to exact revenge on Gayath. Armory is on the outside with Sotsas. It's magical for her second Irish champion states. Lowers the colours of Gaia. Armory Sot says Japan and Leo de Fury. And Fran, this was a cracker. Oh, cracker. Yeah, it was there, Johnny. It was one of, one of the few people there in the day. And uh, it was just, I went up into the stands to watch it. It was on radio cam and I uh, went up in the stands just looking at it on my own. And they went at it from two forums out. Shamey Heffern and Guy at uh, William Buick and Shamey and Magical. And they eyeballed each other. And uh, it was it was a proper, proper clean duel to the line and a uh, great race. Right. Um, it sounds like we've spoken a lot about uh, Leopardstown. Now, that is next weekend. So we're going to have a special show next weekend looking at two brilliant days of racing at Leopardstown and the Curra. Um, Irish Champions Weekend um, has become such a big thing. And obviously, with crowds coming back, it's going to be um, special this year, I think. Uh, prop- the first proper crowd really back in an Irish race meet. Um, both kind of, um, I suppose, the showcase of the flat in Ireland. But we're going to talk about Navin and Wexford now to conclude the show. And um, Fran, Navin is... Actually, one of my favourite tracks, probably more for jumpers than, than flat horses, but it's what happens in the last furlong that's so intriguing. Um, how would you describe the hill there? In Navin, um, we seen the two-year-old race last week. If you if you backed any of the first four, uh, you think you were home uh, the first race of the day, and uh, you know then one swoops down the outside and gets home. It's uh, it's uh, quite tough uh, on fast ground. It's hard to make up ground, but that hill in the last furlong can change the result markedly. The three o'clock is the Irish Stallion Farm GBF Premier Nursery Handicap. Um, eight runners. Now, again, I think this could have been a stronger race. There's only one horse rated above 80 in it, um, which is three bags full, who's been, I suppose, fairly held in the last three runs. Heart to heart ran very well here last time. She was just touched off quite well backed. Um, Jarvis, obviously, for Colin Keane and Gerald Lyons has had plenty of chances. Um, I suppose, Fran, the, the most interesting was impeached Alexandra, who looked so good at Cork and then basically burst the blood vessel at Nace when she was disappointing. Yeah, and uh, interesting off mark at 78 in that race. Um, it was a race I didn't have a strong opinion on, Johnny. I'm very happy to watch it. I think Three Bags Full got a massive hike in the ratings for winning at Bellistown on that occasion under £10 claimer. Jamie Powell is back on board. That will offset his rating of 85 now but uh, he looks pretty much exposed and I'd be looking at the likes of Impeach Alexander um, heart to heart ran extremely well last week uh, for the Ballydale team off a rating of 74 and uh, then you got a couple of handicapped evidence for Ken Condon and Jimmy Coogan but it's a race I don't have a strong opinion on but theoretically Impeach Alexander if you take out that last run a rating of 78 could be very exploitable What do you make with Johnny Mac? Um, I saw a Roy went in Sligo that evening back in early August time, beat a horse of John Marvin. Now it's a, a long standing maiden at Arges that it beat, but that could have a chance there off a 13 Billy Lee rides it. Very disappointing at the Curra last time, yeah. just found nothing, but uh, might step up. Fran, have you ever toasted your winnings with the owners in the Troy Town Bar? 
no, but I've been up there. Um, I, it's a good viewing point above the wear, isn't it? It is indeed, and you meet some of the characters of the game there. I'd, I'd actually highly recommend it, and I say that because the Troy Town Bar handicap is the two twenty-five. What happened, Indigo? Balance the last day, Fran. Oh, I, I think he had everything in his favour last day. He was a big mark mover. He looked to have a good stand side draw on that occasion of Takura. Um, look, he wasn't beaten too far, but has he really run a race since uh, winning a Tipperary early in the year? I know he ran well back at the track, but for me, he's a horse to be wary of. I'm not just convinced about his resolution. When he's good and he's on song and he's dominant, he can, he can look very good. But when he gets in a bit of a duel with some horses he just seems to lay down a little bit and uh, to stiff for five furlongs and Navin will definitely play to his strengths but I'm very happy to watch him and uh, with 10 stone uh, the likes of only spoofing who's been busy will be interested back at five furlongs I do think that six furlongs has been stretching that one if you go back to his UK runs he could be very interesting for uh, Kevin Coleman and again, this is a slightly uh, unbalanced race, Johnny Mack, in that most of the runners are rated 80 or less, but you have a horse rated 98, uh, as Francis. Change of headgear for Indigo Balance. Yeah, Indigo Balance is the class act. Maybe Keith Watson's one I've about. That one in Cork, I think, over five um, earlier in the, the season. That mm. could get the McDonough rides it in the John. I think John Nicholson owns it. He does indeed. Um, the, the rest of the card, Fran, any thoughts? Yeah, um, the 150, we spoke about Johnny Fien having a nice two-year-old winner uh, at Dundalk on Thursday. Dragon's Call is definitely worth to mention. Been running well in defeat. Joey Chardon is back on board. Uh, Key pieces first... for the first time. Yes, and uh, just just is ready ready to pop up at some point and be interested to see what price that is. Uh, the 335 that um, uh, Philly's made over a mile, a uh, couple of these have uh, formed an intersex uh, climate and uh, Vario are quite close. You match the run and ace behind Ulster Blackwater. A very interesting on Hazia, uh, Mick Halford's runner dropping down to a mile. I do think uh, 10 furlongs has been stretching her somewhat. A mile around Navin could suit her well. That run uh, behind Annerville at Leprestown earlier the year would read very well now, Johnny. And uh, Noel Mead, um, I'm going to be all about him in the last two races. Uh, he'd a winner during the week he, Ben Seagal was just beat last night in Clamel he is due to run again tonight at Down Riley if he doesn't bounce he should should nearly win tonight I thought he showed an unbelievably good attitude at Clamel oh he, he just wants further you know like wants nine, hurdles no well you know that'll come in time but nine and a half furlongs in Clamel he just lacked a little bit of pace mm. didn't he you know a mile and a half tonight in Down Riley if it doesn't come too soon I think he will take beating and Noel's horse a bit quite I think they're really back ready to come back to form based on recent week, the recent week at least. And in the 410, Evergreen and Red love a step back up to 10 furlongs in that apprentice race. He won well in, in Cork earlier in the year when he's well well backed to win and uh, ran well at Galway uh, when last seen over a mile. And uh, in the 445, uh, we got to forgive Jeff Kidder uh, that run at Killarney. So like he, he looks... You know, you know, we could be saying this until Christmas that he looks a blot off 63, but he's got everything in his favour in that last race if he's back in anywhere near his best form. Yeah, I, I don't think he stayed at Clarence. You, know? like you can't just you can't just accept that a horse, if a horse is a good two-mile hurdler, that he'll get two miles one on mm. the flat. And he didn't. Now, he was sent off Eden's favours. He's quite weak in the bet and he was odds on, but the mile and six, I think, will suit him better, Fran. I, I think so. And uh, I, I think... It, you know, looking back to now, the Mead horse seemed to be really out of form, didn't they? You know, from mid July, early July until what until the last two weeks, they've kind of had six weeks in the doldrums. Maybe he just mm. wasn't at his best. And uh, you know, I think as you said, three furlongs less and uh, a more maybe more galloping track like Navin will suit him well. And uh, be disappointed if he didn't win tomorrow. Now, so Fran uh, is talking about uh, his selections at Navin. Johnny Mac, anything at Navin? And you can also include Wexford, which has an interesting jumps card. Yeah, you were talking about Colin Keane there earlier. Chestnut ran well in that valuable Ballyhain race at Nace um, early August time. He should be a big player in that first race. The, the maiden over six furlongs. Very quickly, Wexford. Edward O'Grady's horse down the cellars back hurdling. I think he's rated £35 lower over hurdles than he is fences. He shot up the ratings over fences. He's off a mark of 87 in the two-mile handicap hurdle. He should be hard enough to beat. And Drew Dalter, again, I think off 11-1 with the likes of some of those Killarney horses in against him. He should, he should confirm that Killarney form. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a probably a bit of a low key card of Wexford, but I would give a mention to uh, Sweet Street in the what is it, the two forty five who holds a couple of these on run at Ballon Road and should take a lot of beating. It's time for naps, and we'll start with you, Fran Berry. I, I do like Sweet Street. That was the only one I like to think. I like when Paul Townend rides for outside stables. He doesn't mm. really ride, ride for many outside rider, out, outside stables. And when he does, you have to take note. Ran very well at Ballon Road the last day, Johnny. Uh, look, Jeff Kidder is going to be very popular tomorrow. I would uh, be keen on Ever Green and Red. But I'm going to chance Hazia in that maiden. I like her profile. I think climate and Vario will make the market for her somewhat. And uh, she might be valued for uh, Mick Halford and Ronan Whelan. Johnny Mack. Let's go Drew, just Drew Dalter again to confirm that Killarney form. Johnny, again, he's getting weight from a lot of them. So we'll go with him again. Yeah, I th- he, he must have a massive chance. I don't think he needs to do any more than actually produce his run the last day. I'm going to go with Cha Cha Dancer, which uh, is run at Navin and um, written by Killian McConnell. This run the 4 uh, 410, um, a horse that basically has just been coming to hand for Chris Timmons. Chris Timmons is based more or less around Navin, hasn't had a winner yet. And I think Cha Cha Dancer, despite a bad draw, he really rattled home the last couple of uh, days. And uh, I think he's a great chance. Lads, um, will you be at Champion Stakes, Johnny Mack? I won't be. I might get Sunday, Johnny. Definitely won't be there Saturday. I might get to the car on Sunday. And hopefully, Fran, there won't be a, a strong wind that they'll sort out the old whistle in the crowd at the car. And it'll be nice to have patrons back at flat headquarters. You won't hear the whistle with the 4,000 people anyway. The place will be rocking, hopefully. And uh, hopefully the weather plays ball, lads. You know, Saturday and Sunday outdoor event. And uh, we've had such good um, run of weather in the last couple of weeks. Hopefully it holds up. And uh, really looking forward to their both days for a uh, racing TV. And uh, yeah, it's going to be good. Uh, it's going to be great and uh, we will talk to you next weekend we're going to preview the two days of Longy's Irish Champions weekend and uh, we will have two days to absolutely save or talk to you then thanks for tuning in to On The Wire Racing TV's podcast uh, brought to you in association with Bar One Racing and if you enjoyed the show don't forget to leave a review uh, give us a like and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode and this podcast is available on video format in all its glory on YouTube And you'll also find us on RacingTV.com and on audio at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and numerous other platforms. Uh, Don't forget if you are having a bet this weekend following any of our selections or so on, gamble responsibly and do visit BeGambleAware.org for more information.